Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Thank you, Frederick, and congratulations to the Gen Zero team for bringing us all here together here today to discuss the, the next steps of evolution of carbon markets and the metamorphosis, you know, what kind of work we need to do together to bring us there. Um, I think the, the Gen Zero opening video has really illustrated the urgency of needing to accelerate the progress, so let me skip that part. I'll go straight into the role of carbon markets. So in the last two decades, carbon markets played a significant role in changing the behaviors, bringing positive impact on the ground. And in the last 12 to 16 months, we've seen really interesting scrutiny and attention put on the voluntary carbon market. So we are at an inflection point, and I, I want us to be reminded how that came about. The voluntary carbon market didn't emerge because companies were finding easy way out. The voluntary carbon market didn't emerge because intermediaries wanted to make profit out of it. The carbon markets didn't emerge because project developers wanted to sell credits. Those are sort of byproducts of a natural organic growth of a market. So in that, I think I, I took some mixed feelings over the last, uh, last 12 months of scrutiny is one, we're no longer seen as a market, a niche mechanism sitting in the corner of climate change discussion. It's finally rose to a platform where it's really at the center of a lot of the climate change mitigation and adaptation discussions. Other topics in climate change are trying to understand how to learn from this market, how to replicate it. For example, thinking about biodiversity claims. So I think there's, a, there's an important role that we need to recognize, and, and I see around the room, most of you spent decades of your career in driving the innovation and change in the carbon markets. So I think the assumptions really need to be pointed out. And it's the nature of the market, there will be profit-making mechanism in between the supply and demand, and more attention it gets, from the investors, the private sector, more confidence it gets, the scale will follow naturally. So I wanted to share two reflections, and I'm sure we'll have esteemed guests uh, and panelists talking about in mu much more details, but I want to highlight two reflections I've really been thinking about in the last year or two, leading gold standard. One is, what do we mean by integrity? I see integrity as a very subjective matter, in a sense that who decides what's high integrity? It's not just a role of the standard body. It's not just a role of NGOs. It's not just a role of market participants. It's a role that sits with everyone, every participant in the value chain, in the, in the carbon market ecosystem. So project developers. I speak to a lot of gold standards project developers and none of them ever start with how many tons they're gonna issue with the project, how much they're gonna sell it for. They always start with, they're obsessed with the exciting design and very concept of the project that's gonna bring positive change in the communities that they operate in. They really do. And when you talk to buyers, they also think about, okay, how do we reduce within our value chain and how do I contribute beyond? And we have to be mindful that in the last two decades, we've come a long way. The, the current structure of the VCM was when there was no policy mechanisms or regulatory framework or global guidance on how to take responsible action. Now we have many coming on board we have thousands of corporates signing up to science-based targets and seriously thinking about how do we reduce within our value chain. And I simplify this, the scope three, scope two, scope one. It's a very complex matter and it's not gonna happen in just one year time. It's a long journey and everyone who's in it will stumble in its journey. And we need to create a community where we are observing, watching, supporting that progressive journey. And I cannot stress this enough. And integrity also comes from recognizing that journey, acknowledging that it's gonna be difficult sometimes. 
and be, being mindful of the buyers, the private sector, the corporates, have conflicting priorities. You have supply chain crisis, energy price crisis. All of a sudden, climate change is a side topic. We want to move away from that. So corporates are working hard to address this. How do we change the governance? How do we change the decision making? But it's not going to happen just on a snapshot, year on year progress. So how can we create a community around it, around the entire ecosystem to support integrity of behaviors, integrity of decisions? Obviously, I'm not saying standards don't have a role to play. Standards have an immense role to play. We're almost like a safeguard for the ecosystem to trust on rules and requirements. And we also need to evolve, align with science. But we can sit and talk about additionality forever. We can sit and talk about permanence forever. But is that going to fix the problem? It's the entire ecosystem that has to change from supply to demand. Also, technology plays an immense role here. Standards need to digitize. Verifiers need to innovate and use digital MRV solutions to plug in. Registries need to speak to intermediaries and trading platforms and national registries in this very fragmented market. So actually, technology can come in to enhance the integrity and scale the market by increasing transparency, increasing the quality of of data that's input into this ecosystem. And, sec and, and, and final stakeholder in this entire ecosystem, I see it as all of us, individuals, consumers of products and services, consumers of media and social media. We love debating over things. We love clickbait titles. But are we doing this, put, are, are we doing this to put positive pressure on actors to act with high integrity? Or are we doing it because it's just in human nature, we love to debate. So we need to also be responsible as individuals to be aware, to be educated, to understand the, the very complexity. If, we're, we, if we want to have an opinion on carbon markets, you need to understand how carbon markets are created, what kind of effort goes into it, how it changes the lives of people, and how corporates are claimed or buyers are claimed claiming it against their several requirements and, and ambition. So before we step into just looking at that snapshot, are we also learning about the challenges and opportunities that sits across the ecosystem? So that's my first reflection. Second one, and I, a good friend of mine in carbon markets told me, Maggie, the emotional story doesn't work anymore. And I disagree. Because the fundamentals of carbon markets is on people. I'll give you an example. Cookstove projects were under huge scrutiny in the last 12 months. What kind of private investor or traditional finance would have financed that other than the, the carbon markets that we have today? And it did bring huge amount of finance into communities. And not only it reduced the carbon emission in those projects, it sent children to school instead of fetching wood. It enabled women to engage in more economic activities so that the livelihoods are enhanced in those households and communities. It increased, it, it decreased the pollution level in-house by cooking and therefore had positive impact on health measures. I'll give you another example, mangrove projects. They sequestered carbon but more importantly, they create ecotourism opportunities for uh, coastal marine communities. They prepare them to build resilience against climate disasters. They enhance, improve biodiversity around coastal marine ecosystem. So are we capturing that? And I, I'm sure most of you sitting here, we're here because we want to put value to those positive impacts and that those value to be recognized and accounted for credibly in the private sector's action and commitment. So we can't not talk about people component because every project, every carbon credit has a story to it. And I always say, not every carbon credit is created equal. So you need to look into that. Those are complex. 
just looking at carbon mitigation, carbon consideration is already a complex matter, but you do have to think about the co-benefits, the, the sustainable development impact, because at the end of the day, these projects are changing people, changing the lives of families and communities. So I'm very much looking forward to the next days of conversations, and hopefully at COP29 when we meet again, and I'm sure we'll meet several times before that, that we can come as a community with solid, meaningful solutions and collaborations. And I know many of you are tired of hearing collaborations and partnerships, but the key is there because not a single body or an organization can fix this problem or scale the market in a meaningful way. It has to be a collaborative work. So I am willing to commit to that collaboration pathway and, and I'm sure we will be discussing a lot of those solutions so that we can go to COP29 with concrete examples, demonstrating that positive impact in a collaborative way, in a, in a transparent way, and, and move on from the debate only approach. So I wish you all the best in the next few days and I look forward to having those conversations with you. Thank you very much. Thank you.